Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night study. We're going to continue in our series on the church. And tonight, we're going to talk about the marks of the church. You know, over the centuries, there have been two primary marks of the church. First, the centrality and the primacy of God's word as his truth that gives life to his people as the church is built and edified through the right preaching of God's word. And then second, it's the right administration of the two ordinances of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now let's talk about the right preaching of God's word. You know, throughout Scripture, people are created by God's revelation of Himself through His Word. Now, God's Holy Spirit accompanied the Word generating life in His people. For example, we see that in Genesis 1 and 2, as God breathes life into all creation. In Genesis 3.15, He gives a word of promise to mankind of a coming Messiah. And then in Genesis 12, he calls Abram to be the progenitor of the Jewish people. In Exodus 3 and Exodus 20, God calls his people forth from Egypt and gives them his word to shape and influence their lives. In Ezekiel 37, God breathes into the dry bones in the desert, bringing life to a vast army. And then in John 1, the eternal Word of God, the Son of God, becomes incarnate for the salvation of God's people. And then in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, we are told to go and share God's Word so that mankind may know Christ. Now, the right preaching of God's Word is not just about the Word from God, but it is also the Word about God. A proper understanding of God and His attributes and characteristics, it is central to the true foundation of the church. Virtually all heresies in the church distort a key attribute or characteristic of God. We see that time and time again. We must preach who God is and all of His attributes and characteristics. For example, we should be preaching that God is one, Deuteronomy 6.4. That God is the author of our salvation, Hebrews 2.10. God is holy, Leviticus 11, 45 through 40, 44 through 45. God is faithful, Exodus 34, 6 through 7, and Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. And God is loving, John 3.16. And God is sovereign, Matthew 6.10. And we must preach that the core responsibility of, my, of mankind is to love God with our whole being. We see that as far back as Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, and we see it again when Jesus proclaims it in Matthew 22, verse 37. And we are to obey His word, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And we must preach the gospel clearly and articulately and relevantly to the world. We should be preaching that God is holy, mankind is sinful, and destined for damnation. And God has provided a way for salvation and redemption through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are to repent and trust in His provision through faith. And the issue is not just a philosophy of living, but a teaching the truth about mankind and God and the atoning work of Christ. So we're not just talking about a philosophy here. We're talking about a total change of the person's heart and being. And the teaching of the gospel is not about our works, but about the work of Christ on our behalf. We've seen that in 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Now, the right administration of the ordinance of the church includes baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, baptism and the Lord's Supper, they were given by Christ both by example and by command. Now, some churches and branches of Christianity proclaim that there are other ordinances or sacraments. For example, the Catholic Church uh, proclaims that there is confirmation, confession, ordination, marriage, and extreme unction. We would call that last rites. But the early church did not follow these as ordinances. 
And Protestant churches sometimes hold that foot washing as is an ordinance to be observed following Christ's example with his disciples in John 13. But the early church does not appear to have practiced this as an ordinance elsewhere in the New Testament. Therefore, we do not hold that that is an ordinance for the church. Now let's talk about baptism, for example. Christ himself was baptized by John the Baptist, and Christ commanded his disciples to go and make disciples and to baptize them. You remember Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. The book of Acts and the New Testament letters, they point out that this was a common practice in the early church. And the method used in the New Testament was by immersion for those who exclusively belonged to Christ by reflecting the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now here's some points to remember. That only those who believe in Christ are to be baptized. Again, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Only those who believed in Christ in the book of Acts were baptized. And, is, and that was used as a testimony to our being in Christ and turning from the world. And Paul teaches the twin assumption that those who believe in Christ are baptized and those who are baptized believe in Christ. We see that in Romans 6 and in Galatians 3 and in Colossians 2. Baptism is associated with salvation, not the cause of salvation. Acts 2.38 and 1 Peter 3.21-22. It, confess, it confesses the grace of God in our lives. It is a great testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives. Now, let's talk about infant baptism for a minute. Now, some in the church support infant baptism because they say that baptism is the instrument that God uses to regenerate the infant. But the issue with this position is this. The New Testament never teaches that baptism is salvific. Baptism always comes after saving faith. And then some also claim that an infant born into a Christian home belongs to Abraham's seed, and that baptism declares that the infant is the recipient of the promises God made to his people through Abraham. But those promises were explicitly fulfilled in Christ. Scripture does not clearly support this view either. Baptism is always associated with those who clearly believe first. And baptism in the New Testament is treated analogously to circumcision of the heart, not the physical circumcision. Remembering that baptism is the proclamation of the gospel, it is best not to confuse the messages around baptism and the gospel in this area. Now let's talk about the Lord's Supper for a minute. Christ himself held the first Lord's Supper with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. We see that in Matthew 26, 26 through 30, and we read what Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 34. And he instructed his disciples to observe the ordinance. We see that in Luke 22, verse 19, and 1 Corinthians 11, 24. Now, the linkage of the Lord's Supper to the Passover is clear in all four of the Gospels. And Paul calls Christ our Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And the church is called to live the Passover feast metaphorically by living together in holiness and expressing unity in love, 1 Corinthians 10, 17. It is to be commemorated until Christ comes again and it will be celebrated at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We see that in Matthew 26, 29 and Revelation 19, verse 9. The scripture does not provide an exact words to use or form to be followed, except that we are to use the bread and the wine to symbolize the breaking of his body and the spilling of his blood for us. It also appears that prayers of thanksgiving and the singing of hymns followed the uh, Lord's Supper in the early church.
Now, only Christians who have examined their lives and confessed their sin as needed should partake. We talk about that every time we do communion here at the Redeemer's Place. And that's taken from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 29. Now, observing both of these ordinances, proclaim the gospel to all present, and it serves as a reminder that Christ is working for His elect. Observing them, it sets the church apart from the world. Amen. Now, let's, let's have three questions for thought tonight. First, I want to ask you to think back over your life and all the churches that you have attended. How many have rightly proclaimed God's Word? Why is this practice so foundational to the church? What happens when it is done well? And what happens when it is not done well? Think about that. Number two, have you been baptized by immersion? Why is that so important to observe for your Christian life? If you have not been baptized by immersion, what is stopping you from taking that step? When, you will when will you take that step of faith? And then number three, why is establishing boundaries around observing the Lord's Supper so important? What are you proclaiming by participating in this ordinance? So I hope you've enjoyed this short study tonight on the marks of the church. And I hope you can join us for worship on Saturday night. We meet at 6.30 p.m. at Victory Life Church, located at 155 Northwest 112th Avenue in Plantation, Florida. The zip is 33325. We would love to have you come on out and join us. It's a great group of people, and I think you'll enjoy yourself. And I hope you have a wonderful week. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.